Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His, and we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. And tonight's uh, series is entitled From Victim to Victor. And uh, over the next couple weeks, we'll be talking about the many different things that um, I as a pastor come up against with people in my congregation, people in this world. Because one thing that is very evident to me is the brokenness of the world around us. Indeed, I think that we try to hide our brokenness and we try to disguise it. Uh, after all, uh, ladies are good with this, right? You put on all kinds of makeup before you leave the house. You wouldn't want anybody to see you without your makeup on. Some people might need to put their makeup on, but uh, we generally don't want anybody to see the blemishes and the flaws that are within our, our bodies, yet alone the flaws and the hurts that are found within our lives. And somehow we've bought into this kind of this premise that pain and suffering are something that are not supposed to be part of our lives. And indeed, something that I've read, if you actually open up the Bible and you read it from Genesis to Revelation, you see that pain and suffering is not only something that is part of our lives, but it is something that God can use to transform us from being a victim of our circumstances, a victim of the problems, to actually becoming a victor. The Bible tells us in the midst of all these things, while we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered, in other words, while we are considered to be suckers, we are more than conquerors. In other words, the world around us would go, hey, you know what, you are going through a hard time right now. And you have no reason to praise God. You have no reason to bless the Lord. And it is in the midst of all those things that we recognize that these trials will come and the trials will go, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Amen? And his faithfulness has been declared from generation to generation. And in fact, the praise team witnessed to this fact tonight as they came here and they ministered to us even while they themselves are hurting. And so it's appropriate that tonight the message is The Wounded Healer. Now I got that title from Henry Nowen's book called The Wounded Healer where Jesus is our wounded healer. You know, we don't have a great high priest who somehow was able to escape all the trials and difficulties of life. In fact, we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, who gave up the throne in heaven, took on our humanity, bore our iniquities, bore our shame, our suffering, so that 
he is now in a place where we can relate to God. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that he is seated on the right, right hand of God the Father, where we can come and receive grace and mercy in our time of need. I don't know about you, but that's good news to me, that God recognizes that we're going to have times of need, and he prepared a great high priest who is able to sympathize with us. So, you know, when people come to me and they go, well, Pastor, I'm mad at God. I'm mad about the circumstances of life. I tell people, go ahead and get mad at God. Go ahead and get upset with God. God can handle you being mad and upset with him. In fact, he wants you to do that because he knows what's in your heart anyway. So get it out, do it in relationship with him, and then allow his grace and his peace, which surpasses all understanding, to overtake your mind and your heart. So as we talk about the wounded healer tonight, the story that I want to talk about is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and it's the story of Joseph. Now, Joseph is told to us in, in the book of Genesis, so most people, uh, about this time it, during the year, uh, they've made their renewal that they're going to get involved with church, and uh, they're going to read through the Bible, and they might get, to gen might get through Genesis before they give up. So you might have read that story. That was my little sarcasm there. You get it? Okay. Uh, People tell me, oh, there's all kinds of new people in church. I said, yep, it's the new time of year. Everybody made their resolutions to get close to God, and then they'll be out by February. But um, here's a story about Joseph. Joseph is 17 years old. He is the, the kid brother that is annoying, okay, because he is the favorite of his daddy. And Joseph has this dream that God has given to him that his brothers would all one day bow down to him. Now, Joseph, lacking common sense at this point in time, goes and tells his brother this dream. Joseph is 17 years old, and his brothers didn't take well to that dream. They didn't take well to the fact that he was uh, the, the father's favorite. And so what the brothers do is they kind of say that jo they make it so that Joseph appears dead to his father and Joseph is actually sold into slavery. Now Joseph had a promise from God. He had a dream that was given to him by God at the age of 17, but we see within the word that it isn't until the age of 30 that that promise actually comes to fruition. And then later on we actually see that God brings about a re, even a greater redemptive purpose and a greater time of forgiveness as Joseph is later reunited with his brothers. But what we see within the story of Joseph is that God is working in the midst of suffering and heartache, not despite it. He's using all things, and that's what the Bible tells us, that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now what that means is while I'm going through a situation, it may not look good. There are a lot of bad situations out there, but what it means is in the final analysis, God will work it all together for the good, amen? So that's what we got to look at, what is the final analysis? And too often, we judge our situations by this moment in time rather than looking at the big picture. And God is always concerned with the big picture. Now, in John 16, 33, Jesus tells us very clearly, we're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have heartache. Now, here's the one thing. Whether you're a Christian or whether you're not, you're going to have trouble and heartache. Now, the difference is, when you are a follower of Jesus, Jesus promises never to leave you, never to forsake you, and his love is what carries you through the difficulties of life. So bad times come on the good and the bad, but whether or not you're going to have access to the strength to get you through is dependent upon who you choose to journey with in this life. Now, Jeremiah 29, 11, it gives you a hint. See, I got ahead of my, my overhead here, but it gives you a hint here. This is, now we all know that Jeremiah 29, 11, most people, church people know this, but I like 
the amplified version of it because what it says is, for I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord, thoughts and plans for welfare and peace, not for evil, to give you hope, what's that say? In your final outcome. Again, it's a hope in your final outcome. Now, interesting that God has to first say, I am not interested in hurting you. For I know the plans, I, thoughts and plans I have for you. Thoughts for plans for welfare and peace, not for evil. See, many times that's how we look at God. We either look at God as kind of the nice grandpa figure up in heaven. You know, the nice, oh, you're special and everybody, I love everybody. You know, we look at God as kind of that figure. Or we look at God as some kind of cosmic drill sergeant that is there to make your life miserable unless you read three chapters of the Bible a day and pray a half an hour every day. But you know, we serve an awesome God that has a wonderful plan for our lives. But many times we won't achieve the plan because we give up on the cusp of the brink of the miracle. We give up on the cusp of that breakthrough. So many people give up, right? How many of you made New Year's resolutions? How many of you made a resolution not to make resolutions? Good. I'm glad I finally got through to some of you. But most of the time, we've all come up with plans, right? We're going to lose 20 pounds. Anybody come up with those plans? Yeah, the losing weight. None of you want to raise your hand. I'll raise my hand. I've made those plans, and then I give up. Why? Because it gets too hard. I like the people that tell me, it's too hard. How many of you ever saw uh, A League of Their Own? It's a Tom Hanks movie about the women's baseball team. And the woman starts crying at a certain point after he yells at her, Tom Hanks, the coach. And he goes, there's no crying in baseball. Well, my friends, we know that there's crying in life. But we all also have to get our big boy pants on and our big girl pants on and realize, yes, life is hard, but God is greater than the difficulties that we're facing. Amen? So some of us need to stop making excuses and go, it's too hard. We were anointed for hard. We were given the spirit of God within us for the difficult times. Where there's difficulty, where there's darkness, that's where the light belongs. It doesn't belong running away from those problems. Now, I digress. Back to Joseph's dream. Genesis 37, Joseph had a dream. He tells his brothers. He doesn't realize that dream right away. Now, Genesis 39, 2 through 3, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph, and he, though a slave, was successful and prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to flourish and succeed in his hand. Now, Joseph's story, after he was sold into slavery, he actually becomes the master of one of the head Egyptians, Egyptian's household. He becomes the head guy there. Now we also see within that passage that Joseph has a run-in with Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar's wife tries to get Joseph and tempt him to come into the bedroom. Uh, story for all you ladies there, okay? Tries to get Joseph and Joseph is an honorable man and he won't do that and he turns away and because he does the honorable thing now, what we would like to say is if we were living some sort of fairy tale life, that if we do the honorable thing and the right thing, then we're always going to have the right outcome. It doesn't always work that way. It doesn't always work that we're going to have the right outcome initially. But God is a rewarder of those who follow his way. And at the end of the day, again, at the final outcome, all things work together. But what we see within Joseph's story during from the age of 17 to the age of 30, is that we see Joseph not having a pity party about the circumstances of his life. In fact, just the opposite. Joseph grows in his relationship to God. He grows in his stature among the Egyptians. And what do people see? They see God's providence at work in his life. They see the handiwork of God. And so many times, we are in pain in our lives and we go, God, why do I have to suffer? And you know, my friends, that's a very obvious question to ask, a very reasonable question to ask. But as Christians and as followers of Jesus, we must recognize something, that our life is no longer our own. And many times, 
we are suffering for the benefit of somebody else. It might be the benefit immediately or in the long run, but it's out of suffering that growth happens. I used to get those growing pains when I was growing up. Anybody get those growing pains where your legs hurt, everything's aching, and my mom would get the heating pad out, and I just would be miserable, okay? Now, those growing pains were what's necessary to make the handsome man that you see here today. <laughs> and I don't know why you're laughing, because I think I'm handsome, and as long as I think I am, then I'm okay. Now, but... Thank you, thank you, Mom. <laughs> Can always count on Mama. There's a story there, but I'll tell it one other day because I'm already in trouble with her today. I won't go there. Love you, Mom. Now, even the pastor gets in trouble with his mom in church. I tell you what, it's really something living this life. Now, the thing that we need to understand is that God is our Redeemer. He redeems our pain. He uses our pain. And so what we need to do, when, look, when we go through times of heartache and difficulty, is to try to keep the perspective on the cross. Keep the perspective on the cross and see that God will do something with this. God has not abandoned you. And that's very hard for us to remember, isn't it? It's very hard because in the midst of those circumstances, we go... I just want to have my pity party. Well, my friends, have your pity party, but then get over it. And then go, let's look at what God is going to do despite this. In Hebrews 5, 8, it tells us about Jesus, that Jesus, as a son, learned obedience by what he suffered. You know, I wish that there was some sort of way that uh, God could beam into my brain all that is Jesus, and then I would suddenly act like Jesus. Don't you wish that sometimes? Like, why does it have to be so hard? But instead, what does God do? If you want patience, he gives you opportunities to be patient. If you want to be more loving, he sends around a bunch of people that are not loving that you then have to love. That's how God operates. That's how the fruit grows. That's how obedience comes about in our life. That's how it was for Jesus, and that's how it's going to be for each and every one of us because Jesus sets the pattern for our lives. And this is the tragedy, my friends. This is why it's such a tragedy that people neglect the Word of God because if you get in the Word of God, you begin to see these patterns. You begin to see how God operates. And you see how God operated in the life of Jesus is the way that he will operate in your life. Jesus, what it tells us, and I might be skipping ahead here. Oh, there it is. Uh, what a wonderful segue. This is what happens when you preach without notes and have the PowerPoint. Jesus, it tells us, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorned it, dealt with the shame of the cross, dealt with all of that for the joy set before him. Do you think that Jesus wanted to go to the cross? No, that would be absolutely nuts. But what we see within the Gospels is, one, Jesus knew that he was born to die. He was born to die for our sins, and it tells us that he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He resolutely set out for that place that was going to cause him pain and heartache. How many of us have been running from that place? He sets out to run, he goes toward that place, but then he has a moment in the Garden of Gethsemane that we can all relate to. He says, Father, let this cup pass by me. He doesn't just say, like, gently in this idyllic voice, but he cries. And it says, to the point that there were drops of blood in his tears and his brow. My friends, he didn't want to go to the cross, but what he wanted more was for the Father to be glorified. What he wanted more was for each and every one of us to be saved. And so for that reason, he set his eyes not on the problem, but on what God was going to do despite the problem. And my friends, that's what we got to do. We got to stop looking at the situation in front of us and start looking up and believing that we serve a God that has an awesome plan and that is going to bring it all together. And my friends, you might not understand on this side of eternity, but that's why we have faith. If you could figure it all out, then you wouldn't need faith. But here's the thing, my friends. I don't understand calculus, but there are people that do. You're an engineer. I hope you do, right? He's going for engineering. I hope he, and, and your pops, right? 
engineering right there? Background? Econ well, I don't understand that either. But thank God that there are people that understand that stuff, right? I don't need to understand how a bridge is made. I just need to be able to drive over it. And sometimes when you know how things are made, you don't want to drive over it. <laughs> so my friends, here's the thing about our brains. We need to stop reasoning so much and just start believing with our hearts because our reasoning always comes up insufficient. And haven't you sat there and thought you had it all figured out and then boop, something happens and then it's all changed again. Why do we keep getting surprised? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and thinking you're gonna get a different result. And some of us, that's how we've been living out our lives, day in and day out. You would be, you know what, people come and talk to me about their problems and they think that they're, they're the, like, this is the problem. And I go, I can point to four or five, ten other people that have the same problem that you're going through. You're not new. You're not as special as your mom told you you were. You're special in God's eyes, but you are going through the same type of thing. And here's the thing. Read the instruction manual, do what it says, and God is faithful. And in due time, in his right time, he will bring about something beautiful in our lives. This is my favorite passage. How do you like that word? My favorite passage. Joseph gets to this point that his brothers come and bow before him. Now, Joseph shows his humanity because he has to show some restraint. Because if your brothers who sold you into slavery came before you, now this is your opportunity. He's the number two guy in all of Egypt. But instead, Joseph shows mercy and grace because God developed that character within him, not because he had it in and of himself. But this is the, the brothers, they apologize to Joseph, and they, they're so sorry at that point in time when they see what they've done. And this is what Joseph says, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done the saving of many lives. My friends, when I look back on my own life, I can remember many nights in tears. I can remember many nights in heartache. And you know, it's interesting that people come and you know, they don't know what's going on in the pastor's life. I, I think they think that, you know, I wake up in maybe some idyllic state and, you know, float on the cloud. Um, but but I have problems just like everybody else and I deal with heartache just like everybody else. But I recognize what God has done in the midst of all those things. Is that the person that I am today is a result of going through the pain yesterday. And it truly is the case. No pain, no gain. It's that way in our physical life. It's that way in our emotional life. And there's many people that allow the pain to break them. My friends, God wants to come alongside of each and every one of us and take the pain of our lives and to redeem it and to use it to help many people. Amen. Amen. But the choice is up to you. Are you going to have the mindset of being a victim or are you going to choose to be a victor? Because Jesus died so that you could be a victor. Let us pray. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. 
Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really.